Here we are again. I'll be discussing today one of my least favorite generals, and not because he was a bad general, but in my opinion, he was a bit of an egotist. But before we continue, this is a part of our series on the Army of the Potomac. You guys love the Civil War stu stuff as much as I do, so I'm going to stick with it for this and one more series after this as well. But as always, please like, and sh like share, and subscribe. At the time of this video, I will actually be at the Gettysburg Antietam Battlefields, where I will be making some live content. But yesterday we discussed the Anaconda Plan, as well as Irvin McDowell. So today we will be picking up from there. So President Lincoln will be replacing General Irvin McDowell with General George B. McClellan. McClellan had actually not been at Bull Run. He had been serving as military commander in the new state of West Virginia, but Lincoln pulled him to command the new Army and Department of the Potomac. One of his first actions were to end the divisions. He was approved by President Lincoln to create federal corps. Originally, the Army was asked to volunteer for three months, but following the Battle of Bull Run, Lincoln asked for the extension on all uh, enlistment forms. So McClellan began the process of building a new army. Instead of using only what was left of McDowell's army, he brought the Department of Washington, the Department of Northeastern Virginia, and then in July of 1861, Department of the Shenandoah, and officially created the Army of the Potomac. But a big issue began. McClellan did not like the Anaconda Plan. He would much rather, especially with his large army, face off against General Stonewall Jackson or Joe Johnson's forces. Both all his saber-rattling he was an extremely slow and cautious commander. Then in November of 1861, Winfield Scott retired as commanding general of the U.S. Army. Lincoln would by default name McClellan his successor, as McClellan was the highest ranking uh, officer in the Union Army at this time. Lincoln was concerned, much like most of the North, that McClellan would be outstretched as already he had been slow with pursuing the war. McClellan would only respond, I can do it all. He would spend the remainder of 1861 to 1862 training his army, making them his own Grand Armée, believing himself only equal with Napoleon Bonaparte, giving himself the nickname the Young Napoleon. In the months he devised a plan using Fort Monroe, Virginia as a staging area to march down the peninsula and surround Richmond from the east. But he would, become, he would come under criticism when not only he would allow General Joe Johnson's army to slip away, but Johnson had slipped away months far earlier than believed originally and was tricking McClellan with large logs painted black to appear as cannons that would soon be called Quaker guns. Radical Republicans in Congress like Thaddeus Stevens would demand McClellan's removal from not only command of all forces, but command of the Army of the Potomac. In March, Lincoln would remove him as commander of all forces, but would allow him to remain as commander of the Army of the Potomac, just in time to begin the Peninsula Campaign. At the Battle of Williamsburg, it would end in a draw, but General Joe Johnson and his Army of Northern Virginia would begin a casual withdrawal west towards Richmond. On May 15th, John Rogers would lead an expedition by river to test Richmond's naval defenses, only to be defeated by the defending Confederate forces. The Union win their first victory at the Battle of Hanover Courthouse on May 27th. McClellan then again cautiously continued up the peninsula. The Battle of Seven Pines would end in a draw, but the McClellan's luck, Johnson had been wounded by an artillery shell. Scouts informed him the new commander was the original chosen commander of the Union armies, Robert E. Lee. Now Lee had been defeated almost every action before this point, so on June 25th, when the Seven Days Battle began, McClellan believed he would whip the Southern forces. But on the 1st of July, 1862, Lee had in fact chased McClellan out of the peninsula. Lee had taken advantage of McClellan's caution having driven him all the way back to the James River. Lincoln and his Secretary of War, Edwin Stanton, demanded McClellan disengage and reform, but McClellan ignored the calls 
instead trying his best not to abandon the campaign. It's at this point Lee realized McClellan was in fact not the young Napoleon. He would then move his army of Northern Virginia to engage John Pope's Army of Virginia, which was at the time joined with uh, the 3rd, 5th, and 9th Corps of the Army of the Potomac. Much like McClellan, Pope will be defeated and chased out of Virginia. At last, Lincoln recalled McClellan again to Washington to mend the Army of the Potomac and the Army of Virginia and help train the defense of the capital. Many opposed this posting, but Lincoln said, we must work with what we have. Again, McClellan would be given a chance to command again when in September of 1862, Robert E. Lee began his Maryland campaign. McClellan would pursue Lee with six corps, leaving two to defend the capital. McClellan would first engage the Army of Northern Virginia near Boonesboro, Maryland, at the Battle of South Mountain, where he earned his first and real only victory against Lee. However, at this point, Stonewall Jackson had also successfully seized Harper's Ferry from Union forces to secure the Army of Northern Virginia a supply line as well as a retreat line between Virginia and Maryland. Lee and McClellan would once again meet on September 17, 1862, near a small village, a small town in Maryland called Sharpsburg. Again, McClellan's caution would be his undoing, but luckily his corps commanders did not suffer from his vice. The Battle of Antietam would be the bloodiest day in American history, with over 22,700 men dead. In areas like the cornfield, Union Confederate forces would fire point blank at one another through the stalks of corn. At the Sunken Road, General Sumner's 2nd Corps would charge an entrenched enemy, even with successfully beating them back, it would be a slaughter. The day was a draw, but Lincoln and Washington would declare it a victory as Lee had withdrawn back towards Virginia. Lincoln would visit the field to finally chastise McClellan and demand he pursue Lee. But McClellan insisted that he had won such a superb victory that the men needed to rest. The reality was the Army of the Potomac lost more men. It's just on the 18th, the Union were still in Sharpsburg and the Confederates were returning to Virginia. Finally, not being able to stand any of McClellan's self-promoting or politicizing, on November 5th, 1862, Lincoln finally removed McClellan from command. He then promoted General Ambrose Burnside as the new commander of the Army of the Potomac. The first year of the war under McClellan had not borne fruit for the Union cause, with the exception of the, in quote, victory at the Battle of Antietam, not many achievements militarily had come from the Army of the Potomac. Alright, thanks folks. Our next video will be our bio on George B. McClellan and the explanation to the Little Mac nickname. And then our next video after that will be on the Army of the Potomac under Burnside. Just so everyone knows, I am not purposely skipping battles or events. I am touching on them. I will be giving them their own videos, especially something like the Battle of Antietam. So thank you all for joining me. As I said at the beginning, while you're watching this, I shall be at the Antietam and Gettysburg battlefields creating some live content, which I myself will be in, so you all get to see me for once. Um, I hope I don't let anyone down. But uh, very excited for that. Please like, share, and subscribe, and we'll see you real soon.